Hi everyone, Patricia Warby, Alchemy Therapist here, and another in my uh, ongoing talks about COVID-19 and what you can do to help heal and prevent getting the worst complications of the virus should you contract it. Um, also looking at the science really, because something that occurred to me yesterday, we've done a lot of talk about vitamin D, and then I discovered this paper that I had reviewed just over a year ago now about vitamin K. And vitamin K is another really important vitamin and it's allied with vitamin D. It actually activates vitamin D in the body. And so it's involved in bone, bone deposition. In other words, attracting calcium into the bones and forming nice strong bone tissue. And that's, I guess, one of the main understandings of vitamin K, but it has a lot of other newly discovered functions as well. Now, vitamin K was discovered in 1929 by German scientist Heinrich Damm, and he named it vitamin K for coagulation. In German, coagulation is spelt with a K. Because he discovered that vitamin K was really, really important to help make the blood clot. And um, it, it produces certain clotting factors, um, and, and the activation of these clotting factors is via a vitamin K dependent GLA protein as they're called. So it helps to make the blood clot. So um, COVID-19, uh, the, the really serious disease is shown to have problems with regulation of clotting. So in some cases, people are getting thrombosis, which is where blood clots form. And in other cases, they're bleeding uncontrollably. So a lack of blood clotting or controlled blood clotting does seem to be a feature for some people. And that was uh, one of the first bells that rang for me really, was what would vitamin K be involved in that? And it seems like I'm not the only person to be thinking about this because a study came out last week about uh, linking the blood amount of vitamin K and a correlation with the severity of COVID-19 disease. And it, it does show, in fact, there is a correlation. So although correlation is not causation, as we always say, it doesn't mean it causes it. Uh, nothing, no one thing causes anything. It's always a combination of factors, but vitamin K does seem to be involved here. The other thing that uh, vitamin K does, apart from um, strengthen bones and control blood clotting, is it's actually involved in arterial health um, because it actually helps to, well, to actually promote the elasticity of blood vessels. Now, if you have low vitamin K, um, the body will prioritize the liver. Uh, it will store the vitamin K in the liver to prevent the liver from um, clotting, basically, because if you, or, or from bleeding uncontrollably, it needs to promote good regulation of blood flow in the liver because without the liver, you die very, very quickly. Um, but certain other vessels are, are affected. So things around the heart, the blood vessels around the heart are obviously very, very significant. And um, first of all, coagulation is a really important thing to control because as I say, uncontrolled bleeding is a certain death. Um, the remaining vitamin K is left for other tissues. Um, so in fact, other tissues are likely to be low in vitamin K because the little you're eating, most people in the UK and in most Western diets don't eat enough. Um, you know, the, this liver situation will be prioritized and then the rest is left to sort of take what's left, which isn't very much. So you're going to get problems of deficiency in what they call extra hepatic tissues, which means everything but the liver. Uh, and that would be bone, uh, cartilage and your arteries. And so vitamin K has a huge link, in fact, with uh, heart disease or um, cardiovascular disease, which is the general term for that. So it's very interesting to note then that um, vitamin K has uh, the ability to help control and regulate the elasticity of tissues. And what we're seeing in COVID-19, um, particularly in the lungs, is that the, the lungs lose the elasticity and it becomes very difficult for oxygen to pass from 
from the airways into the bloodstream. And so that really, again, was, was making me think, I wonder if vitamin K is involved here. It does seem very likely. Um, so, so yeah, so it's involved in arterial health. And now we've also noted in Japan where they've had a reasonable amount of infection, they've had hardly any deaths, particularly in the regions which consume the highest amounts of a substance called natto, which is a fermented food, uh, brewed actually, it's brewed, it's like beans that are brewed into this sort of gloopy goo. Um, and they tend to eat it on their cereal in the morning. Um, and so they have the highest intake of vitamin K that we know of, and they have the lowest incidence of serious COVID-19 disease, the so-called um, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, ARDS. So that seems a coincidence, or is it, I would say it's more uh, a correlation. So um, knowing that most people in the West are vitamin K2 deficient, uh, we should be eating roughly uh, 45 micrograms in order to give this benefit to the arteries where um, so where we've got excess calcium in the diet which is very common um, and we're not pulling enough into bone the the body will deposit it into the arteries instead and that's actually what causes the lack of elasticity and um, yeah the blockages that we see in cardiovascular disease so eating a certain amount of fermented foods, which is the best source for the K2 that we need. Um, K1 is found in leafy veg, um, but it's not, that's not, that's the clotting factor. We need more K2 for this arterial benefit. Um, by the way, if you're taking statins, you absolutely do need to supplement with K2 uh, as well as coenzyme Q Q10 because um, statins actually prevent the recycling of K2. Uh, normally K2 is recycled about seven times um, and it, to reduce your risk of calcification in the arteries you really do need to be taking K2 in addition to normal foods because you, you will be using it up much more readily on statins. And I would say, actually, for postmenopausal women, that is particularly important. You shouldn't really be on a statin unless you have heart disease. Um, the idea of using it prophylactically, in other words, as a preventative, is dangerous, in my view. Um, and, you know, no proven benefit for women. It's been shown to have benefit for men, but women probably shouldn't be put on it. So, but if you are on it and you want to stay on it, then I would say do supplement with k2 and uh, you can find it in a lot of uh, multivitamins now but if you can find natto uh, that's the best source so so we've looked at bone arterial and also clotting factors what else does k2 do well here's where it gets really interesting um, it's also involved in insulin sensitivity uh, in other words the build up to diabetes where we often get insulin sensitivity first where the tissues lose their ability to respond to insulin and so um, you you find that they the the sugar isn't taken out of the blood as well and it it basically causes all the problems of pre-diabetes so to improve insulin sensitivity the idea that the cells can respond to insulin better um, would be a great thing if you are teetering on the brink of being diabetic. And did you know that you can take K2 and it, it actually reduces your risk hugely? Within four weeks of supplementation, the, um, the effect of K2 is to reduce in the inflammation and improve your cell's ability to respond to insulin. And that seems to work for men and women of all ages. So, and by implication, it also reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease. So what's not to like about this? Um, if it reduces your risk of diabetes by 20, 20% uh, and also prostate cancer risk men by 35%, then I would suggest we, we need to be taking it um, once you know that your levels are low. Um, but I would assume your levels are low probably if you're eating a normal Western diet and not eating many fermented foods or foods with soil on because it comes 
also from the bacteria in your gut as well. Microbes make it, particularly bacillus bacteria. And we're not eating a lot of soil because most of our food is, is sterilized. It's not only washed, it's washed in uh, chlorine solution. Bagged salads are particularly bad for that. If you open a bagged salad, you can smell the chlorine. So the final function of K2 is in our mitochondria in our cells. Now, mitochondria are the little energy organelles that produce the energy for everything in the body um, via a little molecule called ATP. It's the energy currency, if you like, and ATP is recycled around the body and it's, it's formed in the mitochondria. Now, um, every cell needs energy, as you can imagine, nerve cells, muscle cells, um, everything really gut cells, everything needs energy in order to function. So if you've got a problem with your energy production, then you can imagine that's going to affect your whole body. And that's another factor that we're seeing in serious COVID-19 disease is that the whole body can become suddenly um, lacking in, in blood perfusion and start to shut down and we get multiple organ failure. So, um, so mitochondria, interestingly, are were once bacteria. So they are the remnants of bacteria that back in evolution actually got absorbed into animal cells and became a function of an animal cell. But they have, like their bacterial cousins, they have a very efficient energy mechanism. And that's why I think we've enabled um, the fusion and become the the creatures we are because of the bacterial help that we've got. So, so mitochondria are a, a bacterial remnant and they, they basically use um, K2 to help add and remove oxygen in what's called the redox cycle within the process of energy production. And so K2 is really important in that as well. Um, it increases the efficiency of the process by the ability to recycle this ATP, this um, energy currency. And therefore, it, it speeds up the process of energy uh, production. So, and it's better than um, coenzyme Q10 even, which is often touted as being um, something, you know, you should take to help produce more energy. Um, in the, I don't want to go into the full detail, but in the mitochondria you've got a, a thing called the electron transport chain which is like a, a relay race of different proteins that pass on the energy around the proteins and often um, there is a rate limiting step there's a there's a part of the electron transport chain which can slow down and and things accumulate before it and can't process beyond that and vitamin k2 seems to um, bind to that protein and actually make it faster and so it, it alters the rate limiting step as it's called so um, it it may therefore be able to rescue diseases that are a function of low energy and low replacement of mitochondria and one of the major ones is neurodegenerative diseases like parkinson's disease which results largely from this slow death of mitochondria it also has uh, links with dopamine as well in the brain but the slow death of mitochondria without replacement is what results in uh, gradual nerve degeneration um, and vitamin k2 can reverse that so it's a really important vitamin um, it, it basically increases the efficiency of your uh, nerve cells your uh, heart your blood vessels it, it will help reverse osteoporosis um, and in quite a, a short time and for all the athletes out there uh, and people who like to work out it may also increase mitochondrial efficiency um, and reduce cramping cramping is a well-known symptom um, of low electrolytes but also low vitamin k2 so if you're getting a lot of cramps at night or when you're out running um, just take note you're probably low in k2 um, i have noticed by the way there is a a correlation with some of the stories I'm reading in the news media of men, because men tend to be higher, um, unfortunately, higher risk for COVID-19 disease, uh, saying, I was a fit man. I used to go running. I'm a, you know, athlete. I do all these different runs and marathon runs and so on. And I'm thinking, ah, that might explain it. They're over, 
overexerting their K K2 stores and they're not replenishing. And so what's defined as fit may actually be deficient and that may not be helping them. So um, just notice then that K2 is also involved in this replenishment of mitochondria, which affects all the cells in your body, but it's particularly related to the rate of aging. So if you want to slow down the rate of aging and feel healthier, K2 is the one to go for. So, okay, um, just a quick summary then. K2 is involved in, first of all, clotting, regulation of clotting, bone health, it improves your bone density, arterial perfusion, it removes calcium from the arteries where they've, been, uh, they've had that deposited uh, instead of in the bone. Um, so it's gonna free up your arteries. Uh, improving mitochondrial health, which impacts on your cardiac output, your vascular health, muscle function and nerve function, and then reducing the speed of aging. So in, improving how each cell can recycle its own energy and prevent cells from dying. Uh, finally, it prevents aging related tissue degeneration. So this inhibition of elastin and collagen calcification, which is causing so much problem in the lungs, and tissues generally of COVID-19 patients. Um, the dose required if you're deficient, as I've said, uh, the 45 micrograms is the minimum, but I would say between 100 and 300 micrograms. Um, that's way less than a lot of Japanese people eat. They eat thousands of micrograms a day. So most of the Western population is subclinically deficient. So although they haven't got overt deficiency symptoms, Nonetheless, we're seeing these symptoms and maybe COVID-19 and the, the virus that's causing that SARS-CoV-2 is sort of unmasking these effects um, and the body can no longer compensate. This is certainly a more holistic understanding and it makes perfect sense. So um, I hope you've enjoyed today. If you want to comment, please do and subscribe. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.